Well, hello everybody. Welcome to our National Gypsum sponsored webinar. My name is Scott Hughes and I am the lead construction design manager for National Gypsum. I've been doing this about 16 years and my uh, territory covers all of New England and Mid-Atlantic. Uh, prior to National Gypsum though, I did work in the roofing industry for several years in flat roofing, uh, working with uh, uh, manufacturers and agents at that time. And that's when I met our co-host. So co-host with me today is an old friend and that's Warren Barber. And Warren is here and I'm gonna get my camera on too now that I can see it. And I'm gonna let Warren introduce himself. Hey, thanks, Scott, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, great to be with you today. Like Scott said, I'm Warren Barber. I've been with National Gypsum for about 10 years now, but Scott and I have worked um, off and on together over the last 25 or 30 years in low-slope commercial roofing, and we're excited to be working together again and ham and egging it with you today. So, Scott, why don't you uh, get this show started? All right. <clears throat> A couple quick housekeeping things before we jump in. Uh, for those of you that have joined uh, recently, if you're on the phone, we don't know who you are. So please don't hesitate, or please in the Q&A, uh, go ahead and put your name and your email address. And if you have an AI number, we'll need that as well. We will be issuing certificates to all attendees as long as we have your email address. And you are all muted, it's just we have a big group. So you all are muted. Uh, all questions should go into our Q&A. And we have people behind the scenes, excuse me, <clears throat> that will be monitoring that. Wanted to introduce you to the team behind the scenes real quick before we jump into the presentation. And this is on the left side is a map uh, of our construction design managers throughout the country. So just take a look at wherever you're located and you'll see a face there and a name and they will be your local rep. What we do as construction design managers, <clears throat> excuse me, is architectural specifications. So we do that via webinars or in-person lunch and learns, those kinds of things. <clears throat> Uh, Amy Hockett, bottom right of that picture, is our manager, and she is in charge of our group and does an outstanding job of, of, of getting, uh, getting us out in front of folks like yourselves. And then Trang Schwartz does an awful lot behind the scenes, so we want to make sure we give her credit. At the end of the presentation, we're going to have that slide up again with that email, uh, I'm sorry, web address at the bottom, that expert connection. That's where you'll find the contact information for all those people. To the right is our construction services department or our technical department. And when you call that number, those three gentlemen are the ones that answer the phone. So don't forget that we have a technical department. And really, Scott, if I can jump in, there's one group that's not pictured there. When we go to market with our cover boards, we uh, utilize independent manufacturers reps in division seven for low slope roofing. So we have 30 firms across the country and those firms are comprised of about 55 or 60 different individuals. So we have a lot of boots on the ground, uh, driving specifications and driving sales. Yeah, it's a pretty good team. Warren and I are gonna kind of go back and forth on each slide with you so that uh, you don't get bored listening to just one of us. We are obviously uh, approved with the IA to give you the program. It is a health safety welfare credit, which is a bonus. So make sure we have your emails for your certificates and obviously we need your AIA numbers if you didn't put it in the registration. We do copyright all of our programs, but we are recording this, so we will send out a follow-up email to all participants with a link to the recorded version. So if you end up enjoying this and you think there's someone else in your organization that should hear it, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do a presentation in your office or my counterparts are, or we'll have a link so that you all can listen to it there. So, you know, learning objectives are super important that we, we kind of guide you in, in which way we're going to go. And Warren and I are going to uh, really focus on why in the world do you need to specify or should you specify, should you even consider specifying a cover board in your roofing system? Uh, we've got a, a roof that we don't see very often, particularly with flat roofs. Once it's built, we really don't think about it. And if it doesn't leak, then that's a good thing. But unfortunately, roofs do leak over time. So we need to protect uh, our, our investment. So we're going to walk you through some UL stuff. Fire stuff, that's my favorite subject. I love the fire stuff. Uh, wind, hail, all of the things that affect a roof, uh, including humans, right? The maintenance folks, people just up and down on the roof doing different things. There's, you know, inverted roofs where we actually use them as patios. So we're going to get into all of that as we go through and talk about really the importance of a cover board. And there's several choices. So we'll go through each one of those choices with you all in, uh, uh, in detail for the ones that are most often uh, used. 
So let's just do a quick overview of this type of roofing we're talking about today. We're not gonna be talking about steep roofing. We're gonna talk about flat roofing like you see in the picture there. So in the first section here, we'll go through vertical elements, which are those blue and orange walls you see there. We're gonna talk about your deck choices and well, at least some of the deck choices, the more popular. We are gonna dig into three insulations, spend just a minute or two on those with the IECC being updated to 2021. There's new continuous insulation requirements depending on what zone you're in. So we're gonna, we'll speak to that a little bit, uh, how that applies. And then we've got to attach all this stuff somehow. So we'll, we'll talk about, you know, fasteners and, and, and adhesives and, and things that we can attach it to. But Warren, you know, we talk about low slope roofing, but I don't pe think people realize, you know, 3 and 12 has got a little steep uh, slope to it. You're exactly right, Scott. So when people say to me, what do you do? I say I manage our low slope roof segment for National Gypsum. And they say, oh, you sell shingles? And I say, no, I don't sell shingles. Um, nothing wrong with selling shingles. But, um, you know, so then they say, oh, you, uh, your stuff goes on flat roofs. And you just said flat roofs too, Scott. But really, there's no such thing as a flat roof or it would be a swimming pool. So we have to, we have to pitch them, we have to drain them. But you're exactly right. 3 and 12 is a, a fairly steep slope. And we'll see that um, on a couple of our slides today where you it's really, you know, is it a low slope or is it a steep slope? But it, it's um, 3 and 12 is greater than what one would imagine. But it's yeah, if you take your finger. Sorry, Warren. If you take your fingers and kind of spread them apart there, you've got about 3 inches. Imagine 12 inches going down. It's got a, got a little bit of a slope to it. But in exactly. first to our vertical elements. So we've got walls on our roof, right? Not every roof, but a lot of them do. And certainly parapets are quite, uh, quite popular. Uh, and necessary uh, for our projects. The thing to consider with parapets and walls is, is it the roofing contractor, Warren, that's putting up the material or is it maybe, is it the sheathing, uh, the, whoever was putting up the sheathing on the outside of the building, are they the ones that come over on the inside and put it up? And then, you know, what, what products do you use for that? Yeah, so that all has to be outlined, you know, before you start your construction project. And, you know, Scott mentioned the IECC a couple minutes ago. And, you know, you as architects or as contractors are expected to um, design or construct higher and higher and higher performing buildings all the time. And so, like a wall, if you were able just to uh, design or install a roof, uh, that, that wouldn't be so hard, uh, you know, on a wall, if you could just build a wall and not have windows and doors and penetrations, not so difficult. But on a roof, as you see here, you're going to have vents, you're going to have equipment, you're going to have other elements up there. And then you need to tie your waterproofing up and over the parapet and down onto the, the exterior side of that wall as well. So they're difficult uh, design, difficult things to design and difficult things to build. And so there's a lot of different elements that you have to consider when you're designing and constructing. Yeah, transitions, all kinds of things going on there that uh, uh, is a little bit more to it. So let's go through uh, some popular choices uh, for our decking. Uh, you, you've got steel, obviously there, concrete in the middle, and then wood on the right. Steel deck is, is just about everywhere in the country. And for those large warehouse projects, several of those uh, I didn't mention in the beginning, I'm from the Philadelphia market, and in the it, several of those projects, uh, of these projects near me are these huge warehouses uh, right in the Jersey over the, uh, the river, and you see nothing but steel decks for miles. So a uh, great opportunity for low slope roofs, but it's, it's just a, a fast way to get your, your metal deck up, and then as you can see, insulation can be laid there with fasteners going everything uh, through it into the uh, metal deck, and that's what obviously holds everything together. Concrete uh, markets like Washington, D.C., which I cover, and there are others with older buildings or historical type buildings that have flat roofs, um, use a lot of concrete. Um, Irma roofs or inverted membrane type roof systems where you've got your concrete, then we'll pour out a roofing membrane and we'll put insulation on top of that. Uh, it has to be waterproof, obviously, to do that, but that's where the concrete decks can support a lot of weight. So we talk about green roofs or garden roofs where we're actually putting so much dirt up there and so much weight we can plant trees, uh, pavers on top of all this for people to walk. So you have to have insulation uh, and a system uh, that can take all of that weight and, and of course the concrete can do that better than anything else. And then Warren, in my market, I don't run into, at least commercially, a lot of wood. 
You're exactly right. But, you know, if you go into your old warehouse districts in, in your area up and down the eastern, eastern seaboard, you'll have a lot of old wood plank roofs that are underneath these complex roof systems that have been there for, for a number of years. In this case, you're looking at plywood or OSB out west where wood is uh, plentiful and less expensive. Well, not less expensive this year, but typically a little bit less expensive. You have a lot of wood decks used. And um, so look at that scorching uh, from the torch there. We'll talk about that snap, crackle, pop when we get back talking about fire. But you do see a lot of wood in, in some markets. And the, you know, the concern here, I remember from years and years ago, is that uh, if you're going to torch down to something like that, you need to, you, somebody needs to stay behind the job for six or seven hours. And you've got to pay that person to do it to make sure there's no smoldering fire. Uh, several buildings over the years have been burnt down because they left not realizing there was something smoldering there. So, um, you know, torching, although it's really cool to watch. Uh, <laughs> ISO, uh, I'm sorry, ISO, insulation. So there's three major types of insulation in roofing. Now, I'm not, we're not trying to be all inclusive, but for the most part, uh, we've got these three options. Polyisocyanurates by far are most popular with flat roofs because of the R value. So you get an R value of seven per inch typically. Now, each one of these products will have varying uh, degrees of R value or specialty products that may have a, a different R value. But for the most part, ISO would be considered seven per inch. And it is a wonderful product because you get a lot of R value for in thinness, right? It's the best for, for keeping it thin and getting a higher R value. Expanded polystyrene is made famous by the EIFS manufacturers or the ex exterior insulation and finish systems uh, manufacturers out there because it's a board that's very light. We put it up on the wall. We can actually glue it to the wall if we want to. And then they can rasp it nice and smooth if the wall has a slight wave to it or something like that. So they can manipulate it very easily and, and adjust it. It's made out of beads in very simplest forms. Think of popcorn pops. We have beads and we compress them together or we compact them together. And that's of the very, you know, I'm being very general with that. But by compacting them together, those, those beads are so tight that really air and moisture, it has a difficult time getting through there. So it is actually uh, not affected by moisture. So if you think about EPS, I've seen it on underside of docks for tidal docks where they go up and down with the tide. I've seen uh, EPS foam under there. Uh, R value about four per inch, so a little bit lower, but you know, it's got advantages with, uh, with other areas. And then on the right, we've got extruded polystyrene. There's a couple manufacturers of that. Typical R value there would be five per inch. Now I know there's specialty products, but typically it would be five per inch. The nice thing about the extruded is that each individual cell will actually share a cell wall with each other. Therefore, moisture and water, uh, moisture and air can't get through it, we're never going to lose our value. Okay, I should never say never in construction. You should, you know, it should last uh, for an awfully long time holding its R value. That's why we use extruded for foundation insulations where we can actually backfill mud and dirt against it because we're not concerned about that moisture affecting it. And the last thing I'll say on this is that, you know, some of these extruded are used in those upside down roofs I talk about. In my DC market, there's several uh, upside down or Irma type roofs where you Concrete, you've got your membrane, which is poured out, and then you've got insulation on top of that. So it's exposed to moisture over the life of it. So it needs to be a product that has high compressive strength as well as, as moisture resistance. Yeah, good explanation there, Scott. In, in low slope roofing, we really see the lion's share of the market goes to polyiso. And um, again, like Scott said, with regard to the R value, You'll see it either paper-faced ISO, that was the original now. A lot of it is fiberglass-faced uh, and helps with the durability of that board. But shortages in poly-ISO this year are very well documented. So we're getting more and more inquiries around EPS, use in, e in, in roof systems. And so, um, but now lead times are getting a bit longer in EPS as well. And you certainly would need a non-combustible fire rated cover board when you're using EPS and, and XPS expanded or extruded, excuse me, we don't see that up on the roof as much. You know, it's good, good R value, but I, I, I think so much of that is used on walls and below grade, like you talked about, Scott, uh, it doesn't find its way up onto the roof as much as possible. But, uh, and today, um, you know, it used to be when cover boards were new in the market, um, it was one of the most expensive components in the roof system. But today, probably um, 
where a lot of your profitability in the roof is, and a lot of your cost is in your insulation. Because you mentioned the energy code, you know, we're instead of doing inch and a half insulation in a cover board and a membrane, you know, we're doing four or six inches of insulation, you know, to meet our continuous insulation requirements. So we've we've added a lot of cost to uh, to uh, insulate those roofs. And that cover board that we're going to talk about protects that investment. So that that's kind of key. So how do we attach uh, uh, the insulation in, in this particular section here? And upper left there would be mechanical fasteners. These are some heavy duty fasteners, have very large uh, rings or washers to them, two or three inches wide. And then the fastening rate would be determined by what kind of you know, wind uplift rating. And we're gonna get into that in just a, a couple minutes uh, that's required, but very common to mechanically attach those fasteners into a steel deck. And then next to the, that to the right would be a low rise adhesive. And I think Warren will speak in just a second to all of that. I'm familiar with the rock ballast. Um, back when I was heavily into roofing, which was 80s and 90s, uh, that was quite popular because you could put out a 40 foot wide piece of EPDM and dump rocks on it and walk away and you're done. But I believe there's some, uh, I don't know that that's even allowed to be done anymore. And then, uh, and then we've got a couple other options here, Warren. Yes, you're exactly right, Scott. So uh, Factory Mutual doesn't like ballast, um, but you know who does like ballast is the uh, the auto body the you know, auto body repair industry and the windshield repair industry because those projectiles in high wind events um, are flying everywhere. And then uh, you know low rise spray foam is, we're seeing that used a lot for adhering um, systems. So we're showing ribbon um, ribbon applied here. In this picture, you know, people are doing testing with our boards with splatter and all the different uh, varieties. And, and hot asphalt, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that's kind of a shrinking category, but still used in some applications to adhere both the um, insulation or to in, adhere the cover board or to adhere the membrane as well. And then really what you're seeing in lieu of hot asphalt is the growth of fluid applied uh, adhesives whether it's water-based or solvent-based, um, this is a growing, probably low-rise spray foam and fluid applied adhesives are the two growth areas. Excellent. So let's get, let's, let's stay on topic with that hot, os hot, hot asphalt. Uh, Build-up roofing, been around forever. And the, the beauty of build-up roofing is the redundancy of it. You've got three or four waterproofing layers. So if one fails, you've got, you know, backup to it. So that's, uh, one of the big advantages uh, of that. Now, the odor might be uh, an issue here, Warren, and then also, you know, the, the, the temperature. Uh, if you've got a hot summer day, this is actually quite a miserable uh, job to have. And you've got to, you know, monitor the temperature of your kettle. So the kettle's not on the roof, it's usually on the ground, and you're pumping up your asphalt to the roof. So the kettle's got to be hotter than whatever temperature the asphalt needs to be on the roof, right, Warren? Yes. So one of my favorite movies, Shawshank Redemption, think Andy Dufresne up, you know, they're, they're hot mopping out of a bucket, uh, repairing the roof in the prison. Uh, a, a great example of, of built up roofing. It's been done for over 100 years and it does make a very good roof with the redundancy that Scott mentioned. But if you see in that middle picture there, you know, they're, they're dumping the asphalt out of that lugger and rolling one of the plies down that smoke is, most of that is um, VOCs. So, um, you know, you, you can, this is still done a lot with schoolwork, um, but you certainly don't want to be doing built up roofing when somebody is in the building. So you do it in the summertime when the students are out. And what's interesting, Scott, is, you know, um, one of the last bastions of built up roofing is Southern California. So if you think about the environmental regulations, we as a manufacturer monitor SCACMAD, which is the South Coast Air Quality District and their requirements, but yet a lot of low slope roofing or a lot of built up roofing is still done in, in Southern California, but we're seeing it um, each year. It gets to be a smaller category. When you and I started out together in the industry, built up was 20, it was 50% of yeah. what was done out there. Today, yep. I think the last NRCA um, poll I saw, it's about 4%. I remember being downtown Baltimore following pickup trucks with kettles behind them. And it was just a routine uh, experience way back. A lot of the row homes have these flat built up roofs on them. And it still exists, but like you said, it's uh, nowhere near what it was. So what we've seen uh, is a move to uh, modified bitumen, 
the modified systems, uh, there's two. We're not going to dig into the uh, the nuances of each one. It's more about just what options are out there today. We want to really focus on, you know, cover boards and protecting things. So, uh, but again, I really like the fire ones. They're kind of cool. I love watching them do torch applied stuff. And you'll see on the left, that gentleman's just heating that roll up just to the right temperature so that enough of that asphalt that's uh, on the roll starts to melt and he gets a little bead pushing out of there. So they got a torch just back and forth. We'll have a video here, Warren will walk you through in just a second. Then we've got in the middle uh, a detail. And I know they've got detail torches that are smaller than that, that uh, but uh, obviously you need to be careful. That's an awful lot of heat coming out of there. And then we also, as Warren mentioned earlier, Warren, I'll let you talk a little bit more about it, but that cold applied adhesive seems to be big. Yes, you're exactly right, Scott. And we're seeing more and more of that. So um, the video that we're going to watch is actually a gentleman torching. He's torching in this picture, um, you know, they're torching the, the cap sheet to the base ply. You see the overlap that they have there to, uh, to, to, seal, the, uh, to seal the joint. Um, and then, but in the, in the video that Scott's going to switch to, you'll see the pre-primed cover board is down. The gentleman is torching to the roll, which is what exactly what you want. Heat the asphalt forward, um, you get a good redundant system here. So they'll come back uh, and follow this with the next ply of being the base uh, or the cap sheet, and it's a good redundant roof system. Now, this is we've shown pictures of um, handheld torches. There's also uh, a system called the Dragon Wagon where you have the torches mounted. Uh, and the tank is mounted to a wagon and it actually torches and then rolls the roll out. So you can, uh, it's an it's, uh, automated mod bit, but uh, this is probably represents about 10% of the low slope industry is, is modified bitumen. There's dragon wagons, think of Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> They're fun to watch. And then the single ply systems, this is really where uh, our cover boards are going to ap apply the most. Uh, and that's kind of what we're going to focus on the rest of our time together. You know, TPO, PVC, and of course, EPDM are all options. Both TPO and PVC are heat welded, which is kind of neat. So we're actually fusing sheets together uh, so that you don't have any kind of a gap or hole or anything for water to get in there. They kind of melt them together uh, as options. And then what we're showing with the EPDM right there is a, an adhesively applied, but there's other ways to attach it. But what we'll show here is you know, the, just using a, a roller and some glue, um, and that's not a technical term, but using some glue and, and sticking everything down so that you get a nice, nice firm fit. Yes, yeah, so um, looking at low slope roofing systems, you know, <laughs> single plies have been out for 30 years now. It started with rubber, EPDM. And then right now, the, the fastest growing area in single ply is TPO. And like you said, Scott, you can have 10 or 12 foot rolls versus a three foot roll that you have with, um, the, with the mod bit that we just looked at. So it goes down faster. And um, you know, if some of you may have had issues in the early days with, with single plies, um, but most of these membranes are probably fifth or sixth generation of uh, iteration of when these uh, this technology was introduced. So today, with TPO being the fastest growing, single ply represents about 75% of all of low slope roofing, and that number continues to grow each year. And you see the heat welder there that he's he's pulling back, and then there's a little hand one that's kind of laying on the ground there for detail work. So it's quick, it's easy. Um, I remember back doing some training with all of that, and it's. Uh, uh, it's, it's kind of fun, actually, unless it's 110 degrees on the roof, then it's not yeah. so much fun. And you need sunglasses with that white stuff. So what we see here, Scott, this is a, a roof in western North Carolina that I was up on last year. So this is a PVC roof. Um, and, and the guy actually said, love the smell of burnt PVC in the morning. So um, to, to take another old movie line. But what he's doing here is he's heat welding, like you described, that seam uh, between the two different uh, laps of the, of, the, um, of the sheet. And as you, you see coming down in the upper right-hand corner of the picture, while this gentleman is heat welding that seam, the next gentleman is laying out the plate. So they'll mechanically attach with, with plates and screws the membrane to the hard cover board 
and then they'll come back with the next sheet and they'll you know they'll lap over the plates and then they'll heat weld that lap so it's loose laid uh, in between the um, fasteners and then it's mechanically attached so it's a good a good redundant system And then we've got our asphalt based fluid applied uh, systems here, uh, more of a uh, type of a coating, right? This is uh, something that's uh, maybe more of a re-roof worn? Yes, so some of the manufacturers will pitch this for a, a new roof membrane, or it could be used in that uh, inverted roof that you talked about before. Uh, yes. yes. Most typically we would see this as someone is trying to repair a portion of their roof or they're trying to extend the life of their roof. So if your budget is to replace the roof in three years, but you've got some weak spots, you'll come up with a fluid applied system and, and get some coating on there to extend the life of your roof. And then we've got spray polyurethane foam systems. And this one I have not ever been on. Now, mind you, I cover the Northeast Mid Atlantic. So yeah, this uh, Scott and I argued over who would get to uh, to um, uh, talk about this slide. So you know, Scott being in the Northeast, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. The where this is used, uh, the hint is in the, the far left picture. Uh, you know, so it's typically used in the West or in the the, the mountain uh, states. Generally, where it's more arid, uh, high humidity is not good. One of your applicators, you know, if a, a sweat drops off his brow, it will cavitate that um, spray foam. And um, but it is a good a, for the right uh, environment. It's it's a good roof. And I've talked to people in the southeast about it. They would say you'll do a spray foam roof once, and that's it. So the, this, I get a kick out of this middle picture because you you know it is uh, chemicals. So you've got yours from a safety standpoint. Uh, the applicator is right to have his uh, to have his hazmat suit on to apply this, <clears throat> but if you look at the laborer next to him, he's just standing there in, in street clothes. And what what, uh, what safety feature do you like about this picture, Scott? Well, I'll tell you, he, I mean, that, that laborer, poor guy, he's only two feet away from him too. Uh, I hope he doesn't have a massive sneeze and step back two steps because it would be the last sneeze he has for a while. Yeah, yeah, we're not endorsing not using safety equipment on a uh, roof, but uh, we, we take the pictures like we like we have them. All right, let's get into to why in the world would you want to specify and include a cover board in your uh, single ply or uh, you know, low slope type roofing? And there are several reasons, and we're going to talk about all of them as we co go through the next several slides. We're going to talk about weather uh, weather events from hail to wind. Uh, to just blowing debris kind of things, uh, for sure, uh, foot traffic. As you can see, there's a lot of things going on on this roof in the picture here, and there's an awful lot going on that we don't even see. Let's assume at this point there's HVAC folks up there, and they're starting to work on some equipment and get things fine-tuned. And uh, uh, so we've got a lot of traffic over our very expensive uh, insulation. So what, we're, you know, what the cover boards will do is help us protect that. In some cases, they'll get, help us with some fire ratings as well. So let's jump in and talk about, we want to give you a little bit more um, reassurance on you know, why we're here today talking about cover boards. As a manufacturer of one, certainly we would like to get it specified and sold in the marketplace. And there are several other manufacturers that would do the same. But it's important that you all understand that it's just not us up here telling you, yeah, you need a cover board. Warren, back in 2000, the National Roofing Contractors Association got involved. You're exactly right. And, you know, we do like to do the scouts on or trust us, we're the manufacturer. But when we were preparing for this presentation, we got a challenge saying, why are we talking about uh, technical documents from 2000 and 2006 when it's 2021? Well, I mean, this is significant because it's the contractors association telling their members, if you want to improve the quality of your work, if you want to extend the life of your roof, and there is Factory Mutual has a report out there that says a hard cover board will extend the life of your roof by up to four years, then use a cover board. And then six years later, that was followed by NR, or MRCA, the Midwest Roofing Contractors Association, one of the largest associations, came out and, say, and, and further clarified and said, use a non-combustible cover board such as glass mat 
gypsum type boards. Now there's cement boards and other hard boards as well. So again, these are still significant documents because it's the contractors speaking to their members about the protection uh, of, you know, of protecting the, the quality and the performance of their roof. But it's not just the contractors. If anybody has gone through the University of Wisconsin uh, engineering department's course that was originated by Rene Dupuy, and now his son Mark teaches that, they will say there, and many other IBEC roof consultants will say, if you're using polyiso in low slope roofing, which nearly every roof does, then use a hard cover board to protect it. So um, the design community and the contracting community is joining you know, with us um, and peer to peer obviously is a great way to endorse. So we really um, lean on these documents and they're still valid for today. Well, it's like most products that are developed, it usually comes from a contractor that you know, says, hey, we need to be able to do this better. How can you do it? And uh, uh, the cover board certainly adds to the, the longevity, as you said, of the roof. Four years, that's, you know, that's a big deal. So let's go through some types and, and uh, we'll, we'll do pros and cons and, and, and talk a little bit about features and benefits of each one. Now, there's a lot here, as you can see but we're only gonna focus on the ones in bold. So those first five, but we gotta be fair. And you know, there are other options out there. We just don't run into them as often. The first five is really what we have our most conversations about with our architect, specifier and roofing consultant. Uh, that's really you know, where we, we focus. So for today, and we only have an hour. So for today, we'll, we'll just kind of focus on those. So the glass mat gypsum boards are just that. They are a gypsum based product and instead of having a paper facing and backing, they have a glass, glass mat facer and backing. The glass mat is coated or treated so that it does not absorb moisture. The core is treated so that it doesn't absorb moisture. Uh, it is a very, so therefore obviously very moisture resistant. The other advantage we have with the glass mat is you're already familiar with the product if you specify a glass mat sheathing for commercial uh, work and most of us do. There's the purple guys, the yellow guys, the green guys uh, out in the marketplace, right? Those colors you see as you drive through, uh, through town. It's basically the same principle. So we're using a product that we use as sheathing and we have since the 80s, we're using it as a cover board, which actually has been around uh, quite a long time by now as well. ASTM uh, C1177, super important. Uh, that is the standard, uh, ASTM standard for our roof cover boards as well as the, uh, the sheathing products. Then we've got fiber reinforced gypsum board. Uh, this is, I believe, just one manufacturer of this. It is a high density gypsum, so a little bit higher compressive strength than standard gypsum. And we're gonna talk compressive strengths with, with all of the products uh, when we have it up. Uh, but it uses a, a cellulose fibers, uh, so we don't, you know, we need to protect it. And it does have its unique ASTM standard for C1278. Yeah, one of the advantages of this board, Scott, is it doesn't, because it's reinforced with the uh, cellulose fiber, it doesn't have a facer. So it would be promoted that it wouldn't delaminate, but we'll talk about wood and water in a little bit later. And, and so we'll, we'll discuss that there, but. Okay, uh, didn't mean to cut you off, sorry. The cement board option. So most of us, when we think of a cement board product, we probably think of a tile backer uh, and, and we should. It's been around since the late fifties, early sixties. Several manufacturers manufacture this a cement board as a tile backer, uh, but there are several other tile backing products out in the marketplace, foams and things like that. So when we're talking about cement board for the roof, it needs to meet ASTM C1325. That's a specific ASTM standard for true cement board type products. This particular product here, as you can see, is um, it has got a wrapped edge to it that gives the edge a lot of strength and durability. So when the contractor's moving around on the roof, they're not dinging it up and banging it up and gives them a nice solid thing to uh, put their fastener through. And if you look close, you'll see these white beads there. That's expanded polystyrene. So what that does is it lightens up the cement board. Cement board, typically we think of it as gonna be very, very heavy. It's not. Well, it's not light as a feather, okay? But it's not as heavy as you would think, particularly when you have these expanded polystyrene beads. Lightens it up, makes it easy for the contractor to cut, and it gives it a very low water absorption, about 8%. So it's a really low, the water beads up on it if you pour water out on it. Now, why in the world would you wanna use it? 
it's very effective against moisture. So maybe moisture from within. We're gonna talk about that in a couple of slides. So I don't wanna to dig too deep now, but it's just unaffected by moisture. When I talk about cement board as a tile backer, I always tell people, you know, when you open up your pool, if you have one in the spring, throw a piece of cement board down there and then wait till the fall when you're ready to close the pool, pull it out. It may not look pretty, but it's still gonna have its strength to it. So it's just unaffected by moisture. That's the real big advantage of cement board. And it's a unique, um, uh, situation and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. So kudos to your kids for spending time in the pool all summer with, with building materials. Little, little <laughs> window into your world. Another uh, one of the original cover boards is wood fiber board, Scott. Um, and you know this is generally it's compressed wood fibers held together with a with an adhesive or cane fibers, um, relatively inexpensive, lighter weight, um, but again, it's wood fiber. So it, this was really um, used a lot uh, in the, uh, when, when built up roofing was very popular. And uh, so it's good to mop to, certainly don't want a torch to it. That's been the source of some of those fires that you referenced earlier. And, I, and there is one manufacturer out there promoting this for single ply as well, but wood fiber, uh, you know, the, the, the selling point there is it's inexpensive, it will take hot mop and um, a little bit lighter weight as well, but it, it has declined in use with built up its decline. A little tough to install on super windy days as well. You might be yeah. chasing boards. Then we've got high density polyiso uh, board. That is certainly popular choice and it's been around quite a while. Obviously our ISO manufacturers will produce this as well. So we'll put down standard, you know, R7 per inch uh, standard compressive strength somewhere around what, 20, 25. Uh, and then they'll cover it with a, a higher compressive strength uh, polyiso products. So it may be not quite as thick, uh, but it gives it a little bit more, uh, more durability. But there's, uh, it's of all of the higher, of all of the cover boards other than wood fiber board, it is probably actually the lowest compressive strength, right? Yeah, that would be correct, Scott. And so um, we always say high density is relative. Uh, we, you know, we talked about compressive strength before. So cement board, or the fiber gypsum board would have a compressive strength of probably 11 or 1200 uh, psi. If you go to gypsum, you're around seven to 900. So polyiso compared to the 20 or 25 pound, you know, I think there's one manufacturer out there with a 150, and uh, most of them are around 120 psi for high density. So high density is relative. If you take a piece and pinch it between your thumb and forefinger you can still compress it. So when we talk about impact in a little while, uh, you'll, you'll see where that could come into play. Uh, use primarily under, under single ply. Right. So good, good time to kind of recap and review, just to give you one, uh, one picture here of, of the products we talked about there at the top anyway. And you've got the first uh, three that would uh, pretty much apply to everything we've talked about so far today. And that's the glass mat gypsum, our fiber reinforced. And of course the cement board, we don't want to torch as we've said several times to the wood fiber board. And then you've got some specialty type products out there. And then Warren mentioned poly ISO is really uh, used in the single ply uh, roofing systems. So what impacts our roof system and why do we want to continue to even talk about a cover board? The cover board is going to protect our, our investment from multiple things, uh, weather related for sure, but we don't want to forget about the human impact uh, of our flat roofs. So we're going to go through each one of these and show you some pictures. Pictures are so much better than words. And, and here we've got wind. So, uh, you know, this is the first thing we think of, obviously with a hurricane, we've had storms recently. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Texas through, you know, got hit twice and Louisiana got hit hard and other areas all the way up through New York um, got, got a, lot of, a lot of wind and rain. So these, this unfortunately does happen, Warren, and we've got to protect against it. You're absolutely right. So these pictures do look extreme, but this is what happens in, in the uh, high wind events. And we talked earlier about wood decks. So in that uh, lower right photo, you see a, an example of a, you know, could be, I don't know how old that would be, but an old uh, plank wood deck that's been in service for years and uh, has been re-roofed over a number of times, I'm sure, but yet still um, serviceable and usable. 
the location of our roofs matter a lot. So whether, you know, geographic, you know, if it's in the middle of the prairie, you're going to get some heavy duty winds. But if we get more, you know, close to a city, you've got different elevations of our roof lines for different buildings. And we've all been in a downtown area on a windy day where if you're walking on a certain block, you feel no wind, you make the corner and it blows your hat off if you had a hat on, right? So those, that tunneling effect uh, can cause issues as well on a just a normal type, you know, windy day. Uh, so we've, we've got a design for that as well, depending on what's around uh, our building. And that's kind of where uh, we've got three maps to show you. So we're going to go three slides here. and We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what the American uh, um, the American Society for Civil Engineers uh, has developed, uh, Warren, starting 30 years ago. Yes, yeah, so wind has always been a big deal, but you'll we'll see like other design requirements is is um, uh, becoming increasingly um, string more stringent and difficult to work with. But you know, going back to 2005, you looked at you know most of the country was a, a 90 mile an hour wind zone. <clears throat> you had just the tip of Florida where you had 150 miles an hour and uh, you know, your coastal areas, which would you, you know, normally think would have that, those high wind requirements. And the West Coast was even lower than 90 miles an hour. So, um, and those are, yeah. today we still talk about these same kind of 90 mile an hour wind speeds as a standard. Now remember that 150 mile an hour at the uh, tip of Florida there. Oh, sorry, that was me, I can fix that little trigger finger. Okay, so this is a, a risk category two wind speed map. And this is for uh, non-essential buildings is, is really what it was uh, drawn up for, meaning warehouses, uh, buildings that don't have high occupancy. And then, you know, look at the center of the country, Warren, where you used to live. Yeah, absolutely. I grew up in Northwest Iowa. And so the, right there, now you're at 114 miles per hour. And uh, you remember last summer, there was some uh, well-documented, um, they called them, I don't remember the, the exact term, but you had some uh, in, interior inland hurricanes that went through the Midwest and had hurricane type speed winds and caused extensive damage. And now, you know, you're looking at that tip of Florida that we saw before at 150 mile an hour is now 180 and 150 covers two thirds of Florida. And if you look up the coast, you know, reaches even you know, in Philadelphia, where you are, you're at 110 or 115. So the high speed has moved uh, significantly inland. Really, you know, where I am covers half of South Carolina and half of North Carolina. So the, the standards uh, are increasing. Uh, it's got to be five or six years back. Anybody in the Northeast, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland area will remember, we had one of these wall of wind events. And it really did a lot of damage. People were without power for, for, for weeks. Uh, a lot of poles had to be replaced. And, and I still remember that. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't, a, wasn't a hurricane. It was just a wind event. And there seemed to be happening. So one more. And this one is for category three and four buildings. So category three is uh, high occupancy schools, you know, buildings like that that have a lot of kids in them, uh, anything that's got a, you know, a lot of office folks. And then four would be our essential building. So it needs to survive. It, it would be a hospital, police station, fire rescue, those kinds of things. And then, you know, if, we, if the first map, Warren, we were showing what, 150, and then we're all the way up to 200 now in Florida. Absolutely. In the balance of the country, you know, the, the heartland is 120. And where we saw 80 on the West Coast, now you're at 115. So the standard has uh, been, you know, the bar has been raised significantly. So I'll let Warren dig deep into this one here. This is, uh, uh, this is kind of a fun, and I'm gonna actually get my mouse working so I can point as you talk, Warren. Good, so, you know, we have a, a, an AIA presentation on fire where we talk about understanding UL in roofing, Factory Mutual FM is really the governing body that dictates a lot of the standards. So you, in this, this is a 12 by 24 wind uplift test um, and you, we're showing you a failure. So the, the blister or the bubble in the middle is where, the, um, where we had the failure. And um, you can see in the picture towards the front, you can see the, the, out, the imprint or the outline of the fastener and the plate. Uh, and that's been heat welded to, um, you know, the membrane's been heat welded there. So if you look in the center, 
around that blister, there's still some fastener plates where the weld is holding, but it's, you know, once it starts to give way, then more and more welds pop and then you have your failure. So if you look at the drawing of that in the upper right hand corner, typically where your failure occurs is you, you, you're putting the, the press, the pressure and the stress is on that plate. So either the screw pulls out or the, the plate will crumble. Uh, and then uh, the, you know, the, the membrane will, the seam will tear, or in extreme cases, you know, the cover board will break uh, as, it, as it deflects. And so, you know, we're gonna start testing this at probably 60 PSI, keep adding 15 pounds of pressure every minute, and then we'll test it to failure. Uh, and then that'll give us our, um, our uplift rating uh, for that assembly. Speaking of higher winds, we've got to worry about our corners a little bit more than when back when you and I were doing this in the 80s and 90s. Absolutely. So if it, on the right would be your standard uh, roof, you know, typically because you saw that on that previous slide, you get the wind swirling around and negatively pressurizing the, the corners. So your, your corners are your most stringent areas for wind uplift then your perimeter, then your field. So uh, the original design would be additional fasteners in the corners, uh, followed by the perimeter, and then the, the, most of the roof is the field of the roof. If you go to the far left, you know today system manufacturers and contractors are trying to figure out how to build this, but you have a, a bigger corner. In this case, you've got two perimeters requiring different fastening and different adhesives, and then you have a very small field of the roof. So ASCE 716, um, it's very difficult to, to design and build, but yet it reflects, reflects those standards that we saw in those wind maps. Another one of my favorite subjects, fire. You know, you, it, I, I get a little bit nervous about you getting so excited about fire, but- uh, Controlled be, fire, controlled fire. Discussion for another day. So um, again, um, UL is the predominant um, fire resource for walls, but on the roof, Factory Mutual is very involved in fire. So class A would be a 20 minute um, combustibility rating. Most roof uh, components would meet a class A or should meet a class A or a hard cover board will help you achieve a class A. So that's about class A, class B, class C is about combustibility above the roof. Something embers landing on the roof, burning down in, where class one is about combustibility from within the building so the fire doesn't burn through and then spread to other structures. So you can have a class A, but not have a class one. And then looking at UL, again, they're looking at making sure the fire doesn't penetrate the building. So burning brand test, that would, that would talk about the ember and test the embers blowing onto roof that we talked about. And then in the lower right is the E84 Steiner tunnel test. And you and I have seen that test um, conducted, Scott, but That's every fun. building material, yeah. it, it goes to a, a, a flame spread test. They burn a little, uh, so the right side of that flame spread test there, that tunnel is where they light the fire. There's a fan in there and they're gonna blow it down the tunnel to, you know, right to left. And Warren, they test all different products, not just cover boards. So they test flooring materials and, and what they're doing is seeing how far in certain amount of time the flame is actually spreads and catches as it goes down that, uh, down that tunnel. And it's kind of, it's pretty brief. I mean, it's not hours that they do this. It's kind of neat to watch it and, and see how all of that works. Rest assured folks, they made Scott stand behind the line. You don't have to worry. <laughs> So hail is obviously comes first thing to mind when we think about roof damage. Um, and it is now a concern pretty much everywhere, but obviously the center part of the country here. And what the cover board does for us with the higher compressive strength is if it's right below our roofing membrane, it makes that roofing membrane much stronger, much more resilient to having hail balls hit it and then bounce up or hit it and then just be destroyed. When that happens, we don't get punctures. If we don't have the cover board, you can see what happens at the bottom picture. You could actually puncture your roofing membrane and then obviously we've got leaks. And the other thing to notice is our counterpart up in the Midwest, Thad Goodman, was in the Illinois, Southwest Illinois 
uh, after a hailstorm, he, he ran outside before it melted and picked those four hailstones up. So you think of hail, Warren, as a round ball, like a golf ball if it's that big, or a marble, but it's got jagged edges to it. Absolutely, and you see the, the map on the left, you know, the very severe hail zone has been expanded. So severe hail covers Charlotte, where I am, um, but very severe hail originally was Texas, Oklahoma, maybe part of Kansas. Now it extends to Denver, Colorado, up into the Dakotas, uh, you know, and covers most of the state of Illinois. So that has expanded and factory mutuals goal there really is, is not to pay insurance claims for hail damage on roofs. So factory mutual has challenged the industry to come up with roof systems and roof components that are resilient and can withstand, withstand hail. So this is, um, a, a video that we're going to show you. We really wanted to spend the whole hour just showing this video over and over, but Scott's boss wouldn't allow it. I, it's my favorite video with all of the presentations we have. Let me get my... It doesn't even have fire in it, but we're, so we're going to head and watch this, but we're going to fire, the ice ball is going to be fired at a seam, at the field of the board, and then at a fastener. So wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> That is just that is just fun. it's it's fun to watch and really what they're doing is they're taking a two inch ice ball firing at it at firing it out of a cannon at over a hundred miles an hour and then what they're going to do is they will take and deconstruct that assembly and look to see what kind of impact no pun intended um, that ice ball had on that roof deck so very stringent testing requirements, um, but this is a big area of emphasis. And really, you know, we get excited about hail, Scott. We get excited about hail, but really your biggest um, factor impacting roofs is the human element of foot traffic and people being up on that roof and roofing, using that roof as a staging area for other parts of the building. Imagine all the weight that that bottom picture, you know, as they stage to do roofing up on that penthouse there, they've got uh, all kinds of piles of material that they're going to move up there. So you got, you know, you're compressing whatever's underneath it. So the cover board really helps protect during that. And then the top picture is a little dramatic, but I'm sure there's some roofs. You know, I've been in hotels in New York City looking down on roofs below me and seen that. So it does exist out there and that's almost constant maintenance. So you, you drop a, a hammer or a screwdriver uh, with a cover board that will help it bounce off instead of, you know, actually putting a hole in the roof that maybe they don't even realize they did. So moisture is a big one, obviously, with a concern uh, from the outdoors. So I think we've talked about that enough. Let's talk a little bit about it from the inside. So buildings that have, you know, high moisture content like ice skating rinks or swimming pools or uh, manufacturing facilities that have, that use a lot of water and heat, uh, will produce all of this condensation uh, that comes up. It drives up into our roofing uh, uh, roofing assembly from, from the bottom one. Yes, and you know, we talked about wood fiber board before, and again, um, it, it, it's a good cover board in some situations, but doesn't handle moisture well. And you know, Scott, you make an important point. You know, we talk a lot about keeping the water out from the waterproofing up above which is important, but we can in introduce a lot of moisture to these assemblies during the, the service life of the building as well, which we need to account for. Sound is fun. We, should, we thought we'd throw one slide in on sound, so we'll briefly just, just speak to that. In my territory, having New England and Atlantic, there are several air bases, and Norfolk is notorious as one of the noisy places in the world because they have the Naval uh, Air Station there. It's the Coast Naval Air Station. So those F-16s and F-14s and everything else are flying around very low level as you're driving and, you know, you're talking to people outside, it gets very noisy. So the hot topic there with roofing uh, is not only our value, but it certainly is, uh, is how do we keep the noise out? And you know, the picture here is showing a couple layers of ISO on the top, which certainly will help, but we really need to attack our sound from the bottom. And national, whoops, and we do an entire um, presentation just on sound. So anybody out there that wants to get into the weeds of sound, uh, we'd be, we would be happy to do that. So I'm looking at the clock, we're gonna roll through here and we've got, uh, just wanna kind of wrap everything up to give you a, a view of all of the products we've talked about and the different uh, 
attributes of each one. And as you can see, you know, the top three there uh, really do everything for us. And, and Warren, we didn't mention much about dimensional stability. Yes, yeah, so let's just take a minute to talk about that. We've added this column to this chart, but we talked about products with um, cellulose in them and you know, wood and water are not friends. So um, wood will swell and wood will move. Um, the insulation industry has done a lot to, um, to reduce the amount of shrinkage and movement that happens in, in rigid foam insulation boards, but yet they do move. So it's important to have a stable, um, both with humidity and with heat, a stable cover board uh, that won't move and um, will be a good basis for your, for your roof. So hopefully Warren and I, um, bantering back and forth a little bit, but have given you at least a, a clearer picture on why in the world we want to use a cover board. You've got options out there. We did mention, I will now, that it's very important that if you're doing a roofing system warranty or a total type roof warranty with multiple products in it, uh, that the manufacturer that's providing the warranty will accept whatever it is we're talking about. But that's why we have product reps uh, to help us make those decisions. So uh, hopefully that, that has been helpful. And I've got some resources I want to talk uh, about with you real quick. And we'll wrap you up here uh, just a little bit uh, 3 o'clock Eastern time. So National Gypsum is, um, uh, is the company, obviously, that you know, provides uh, the services. Gold Bond is our manufacturing facility uh, or company for our gypsum drywall products, perma bases for our cement board that you saw, and then we've got Proform finishing products for our joint compounds. Dexcel roof board is National Gypsum's uh, products for the glass mat roof board as well as the cement board you saw today. So we actually have two glass mat roof boards. One is for mechanically attached roofing, so we don't glue to it, stick to it, hot mop to it or any of that kind of stuff. We're actually going to mechanically attach it with a fastener into the deck and then put our roofing membrane on top of that. If you are going to use an adhesive, then we go to our fully adhered FA glass mat board. So Dexcel FA. So that's the differences. And uh, now we can use asphalt and things and stick to it. We just have a different coating, a different, uh, yes, coating to the, to the mat to improve that. The cement board is kind of unique in that, in roofing anyway, not in tile backers we talked about. But for those wet environments or those concerns of moisture from in, within coming out, it is by far probably the best choice uh, to use out there. It's on Madison Square Garden in New York City, as an example, and several other projects around, uh, around the country. But a very good, high compressive strength uh, for, for those roofs that are going to get a ton and ton of traffic. And Warren, I'll let you hit this one real quick. Yes. So Scott mentioned system manufacturers and system warranties. So over the past six years, We've worked hard doing our testing and getting our warranty agreements in place. So we have a staple of manufacturers that we're working with and each year we continue to add one or two more system manufacturers. So important part, these partnerships are of our program. Yeah, stay tuned, more to come. The XP line of products is our gypsum board, our mold and mildew resistant gypsum board. We've got several offerings as you can see here. Uh, we've got an abuse as well as an impact version. We do a whole AIA presentation on that if anyone is interested for their firm. We have Soundbreak XP, which is for higher STC ratings in your wall assemblies, uh, replaces dr regular drywall and will perform much better and get you a higher STC keeping the wall thin. We do a whole hour presentation just on that. We have the EXP line and that is our glass mat or our fiberglass mat uh, gypsum product line. So it's no paper on these products. It's just glass mat, meaning you could install these in a building that's not dried in and we guarantee it as long as it's hanging it can't be in a pile of mud but is it hanging on the wall you get up to a 12 months exposure warranty even if it's inside the building and it just had you no know, windows aren't in roof isn't tight those kinds of things so you've got a lot of options there including of course the purple sheathing you see as you drive around permabase is our cement board manufacturing company and that's the cement board you saw dexcel uh, cement board and we also have it as a tile backer with various sizes and thicknesses. And we even do a whole hour presentation just covering uh, thin stone, thin brick being adhered to our Permabase CI, which is insulation and cement board all in one product. We meet our CI requirements for the 2021 code and we can stick something to it, whether it's you know, thin stone, thin brick or stucco. So great option there. We have you covered as far as joint compounds, not super glamorous, but we, whatever it is out there that you all are specifying, National Gypsum is rest assured, 
we've got one of those. And I want to end with about three slides on some technical resources that most folks do want to have. The sound book too is 120 pages of tested wall um, STCs. So you've got four on every page and they're with all different types of studs, wood studs, metal studs with 20 gauge, 25, and there's even some 18 gauge in there. Spacing, 24 and 16. So page after page of all this stuff, chase walls, all kinds of different things uh, that are in there. And you can see with our soundboard how it tests and you can see without. So it's a great resource available on our website, which I'm gonna show you. Uh, Purple Book 2 is the other resource we wanna mention. This is more UL focused, uh, fire stop focused, head of wall details. How do you fire stop for deflection tracks? How do you do it for two hour, three hour, four hour walls? You got a wall coming up to a beam and they're not gonna you know, line up. How do you fire stop that? All of those kinds of things are in this book. 120 pages of those kind of details with all the UL references in there as well. We got you covered for sustain, uh, sustainable documentation. So don't ever hesitate to specify us. We've got you covered uh, with HPDs and the Claire labels and Green Guard, Gert, Green Guard Gold certification as well and the products that need it. And then we've got second to last slide here is our uh, website. So if you go to our uh, nationalgypsum.com, there's a link to the Design and Resource Center. Uh, whatever you're looking for, you can find it there. I encourage people to go to nationalgypsum.com, hit the little magnifying glass, hit the search bar comes up and type in what you're looking for. Three clicks, it's gonna pop up. Do that to find the purple book and do that to find the sound book and you can download them right to your computer. If you would like us to mail you a hard copy of those books, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, I believe that'll be open for another minute or two or write down the email address. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying email. The website address, bottom left, nationalgypsum.com backslash expert dash connection. And then you can actually reach out to your local uh, person and we'll be happy to either deliver them or uh, mail uh, copies of those to you. So that is it, folks. I know I've, uh, we're out of time. We're at 301, so we did pretty good. We appreciate everyone's time and please don't hesitate to reach out and, uh, and ask for, for assistance with specifications. Warren, it was fun. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for letting me hang out with you. Thanks, everybody.